I appreciate everyone taking time out of their uh, busy schedule to uh, come hear me opine about uh, my views on uh, modernization, mainframe modernization, and, and what it means to move an application to the cloud versus, you know, just something that runs in the cloud. So with that, let's jump into the discussion. So, so many times when I'm speaking with a, uh, a customer, a prospective customer, or, or just colleagues networking with people on LinkedIn, um, because people solving this problem are, are really somewhat of a community. So in, in some ways, I feel like, you know, if, if we don't all know each other, we're making new connections every day. And it, it, what we find, what I find talking to people is, is some customers really understand this problem, some vendors, you know, some global systems integrators. And, and as much as, you know, this, this Rocky quote, which I love Rocky quotes, um, it is very true. What, what's often important is to, to understand about, like, how did we get where we are? is you know it, it is a domino effect of conscious business decisions more often than not but not decisions that were made because people were trying to you know drive towards a bad outcome it's just that you know what makes sense at any particular time over time those decisions add up and and as you have pivots in the industry with technology with you know with resources all in a sudden, what seemed like a really good idea five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even, you know, last year, is suddenly just, you know, misaligning with where you're looking to go from a strategy, from a, an ability to execute. And, and I, you know, coming from my martial arts background, there's a, a great leader uh, Master Ernie Ray is, and, and and I had the luxury of attending one of one of his his training sessions, his boot camps, and and we all got T-shirts, and there were these three three statements on there, and and the first one was, you know, it was it, and I'm going to ruin this and embarrass myself because it's recorded, but it was you know respect and honor the belt, right? Like where you are is a reflection of people working hard to achieve goals and being rewarded for achieving them. Right. Understand with an open mind. Don't be so quick to judge the decisions of how you got there because you're going to alienate critical stakeholders with subject matter expertise that you need to take you on this cloud journey. And, and now sort of like just this popping into my head stream of conscious. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say I forgot the third one, but I'll Google it. Um, but I, I just wanted to say that I'll, I'll move on from here. Um, so mainframe and cloud dilemma, we, we talk about what, you know, what's the difference between an application on the cloud or an application in the cloud. I'll, I'll get right to the punchline, you know, often, uh, particularly mainframe applications, whether you're modernizing them to a language like, you know, like C sharp on .NET or Java, or you're keeping the system in COBOL and you're using a tool like Microfocus COBOL or some open source COBOL to move it there. Too often what happens is that very first step, and it's a big step, becomes nothing more than a lift and shift. And you end up with this single availability zone type of deployment. And when you're thinking about a cloud architecture, the first thing you really have to understand is the history of cloud. And, and I encourage you to sort of go on the journey and understand, you know, what caused Amazon to create, you know, their cloud infrastructure and eventually to, to offer it as a service. Understand the history of Google and how Google built data centers and, and how, you know, when, when uh, you know, when Brennan Page were in Stanford how they actually constructed the original web crawlers for Google. They actually found abandoned hardware, hardware that had failed, hardware with broken parts, and they developed software that ran on top of these. And it, the way they approached solving the problem of, of, of building these applications was to assume everything failed. And, and that's a basic premise of an application in the cloud. And, and it's a fundamental difference than how mainframe applications have always been built. And, and, and this is why, you know, we sort of just say, look, it's, it's not the same. You're comparing apples to oranges. 
and, and you can pick which one is, you know, the apple and which one is the orange, or if you don't like the metaphor, that's fine too. Um, but, you know, let, 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 let's talk about some of the things around why this is apples and oranges, right? You, you, you have just massive differences in how performance and scalability, reliability are, are managed, how data is managed, about the responsibilities be, between, you know, and uh, what, what is the responsibility of, a, of an application developer versus, you know, what is the responsibility of the, the, the infrastructure teams and the system programmers that maintain this hardware and software with, with tools and things provided by IBM. And, and you just keep going through this. Okay, well, what's the difference in operations and, and, and what are all these differences? And, and you realize as you get into it, there's actually a lot of big differences, right? So I've, I've put together a couple of slides to just share my thoughts on, you know, if you're a mainframe developer and, and you come from a perspective of mainframes and you're thinking about moving something to the cloud, you know, just first of all, understand the environment that you've been working in. And then just, you know, take a look at this from the perspective of what does it mean to be in the cloud? So like, I'll give you some examples. Seven freaking nines of high availability is what you get with an IBM Z15 mainframe. When that is configured and running in a clustered mode called a parallel sysplex, you have no single points of failure. It is vertically scalable. You can carve out as many logical partitions, AKA virtual machines as you want. They have this really mature workload manager. It's rules driven and it's like, I don't mean to sound like I'm saying don't leave the mainframe or whatever, but you have to understand where you're starting your journey from. Your application programs inherited all of this. They really didn't do anything to achieve seven nines of, of availability. And, and what gets really interesting is if you, if you take this notion of parallel sysplex and you extend it one more, there's this thing called a geographically dispersed parallel sysplex or a geoplex as, as some of the geeks call it. And it basically takes that high availability cluster. And now instead of having it just be in a single data center, it spreads it to multiple data centers around the world. So in theory, you have your disaster recovery built in, but wait, because mainframes have been so trusted and rock solid, these companies running geoplexes often still have a hot, hot disaster recovery failover site. So when you're thinking about moving to the cloud, you really just have to understand where you're starting from. So from a cloud perspective, just like the original design of Google's infrastructure, assume everything around you is going to fail. Not because the cloud providers don't know what they're doing. They're actually very sophisticated at what they're doing and they get better every single day. But because the infrastructure that you're using as a service or the platform as a service that you're using, it's a shared responsibility. Even if the cloud platform doesn't have an outage, there's the likelihood that you know, you've made a mistake in how you've consumed their infrastructure as a service. Because after all, infrastructure is just code when you use a cloud platform. Just like you can introduce bugs when you write in COBOL or Java or, or C Sharp, you could do the same thing with infrastructure, right? How many nines do you need? Do you really understand the single points of failure? Uh, when I talk to people about single point of failure analysis, I often get this deer in the headlights look. Most people that I have worked with across my career have never even heard of this concept, right? You know, you can scale in the cloud. Everybody's heard the buzzwords, uh, elastic capacity scaling, pay for what you use. There's great services for distributing workloads, whether you're using, you know, an API gateway, um, doing things like elastic IPs or horizontal scaling with, with, with function, and function as a service and, and, and clusters, all sorts of ways to do it. But what's different is 
you have to design that solution. It's not just something you inherit because you drop your code into an IBM mainframe where all of these things have already been solved for you. And then what you have to also figure out is depending on your workload, whether it's batch or, or, or online, how do you get the same or better response times? And then how do you do that and continue to drive down the cost of that? Because part of the challenge that you're going to have, particularly at the beginning of your cloud journey, is you're still going to have lots of upstream and downstream integrations with the mainframe. You may have data spread across the cloud and the mainframe that you need to integrate with. And, and there may be you know, different approaches you need to take to do that, to, to replicate, to put eventual consistency architectures in place. And, and those all take time from your response time or from your batch cycle time. So now you need to think about what do I do to get the time that I invested to get here? How do I drive that back out of my, you know, my actual compute time? It, these are non-trivial things that are often overlooked. And, and this is why there's such a trail of tears around you know, customers that have tried moving to the cloud. And, and as a vendor, you know, I'll raise my hand with the rest of the vendors and say, we know that, you know, we're going to be, you know, sharing some of the, the blame when, when these things don't go well. And, and this is why I'm openly talking about, you know, not just our solutions, but even other companies in this market space, you know, marketplace, like I mentioned, because it is a close community and, and we all want to see customers succeed regardless of the approach you're using. When a customer fails with any product, whether it's ours or our competitors, it's bad for everyone who's looking to solve this problem of bringing legacy applications into a cloud native infrastructure. Um, security and compliance. What's interesting is if you think about the mainframe, it's historically a closed system. The networks ran, you know, the networks were not TCP based, you know, they've obviously evolved over the last 20 years, but, you know, th these were systems so deep inside of a walled garden with fortress security and really no, no way to attack them. The attacks were typically orchestrated by, you know, disgruntled employees or people just making a, a, a mistake. Um, and, and you think about things like compliance, like, geez, you know, how do I know that my data uh, is, is not in a region of the world where it shouldn't be? Am I storing, processing, transmitting data for, you know, uh, residents of the European Union in the United States outside of, of say, GDPR or, or some other, you know, uh, privacy regulation? It, when you're working with a mainframe, these decisions are beyond the reach of an application developer to make. The data center is built. You literally know the physical disk and location where that, you know, where a file or, or data is. And, and, and you simply lack the ability to make a choice to put it somewhere else just because of all the controls that are in place. The guardrails are there to prevent bad things from happening. When, when you go into a cloud, granted, you know, companies will often have, you know, a lot of reference architecture. They'll have policies and procedures. They'll have guidelines. You'll have controls in place. But if they've engineered these controls so much that you lack the autonomy and the freedom to execute and, and to take advantage of cloud services, then essentially, they've adopted cloud and put so many constraints in place that it will actually be worse than just staying on the mainframe. So the reality is that more often than not, teams are going to have some latitude to make these decisions. And you're going to have to think about security controls and role-based access controls, and, and very much so making sure that, that data is only stored, processed, and transmitted where it should be. Uh, oof. Data management, this is a topic that, that could literally be, uh, you know, a whole separate, you know, webinar one day. Um, it, 
I, I have heard so many people in data management just say, you know, data is like manure. It is just spread out all over the company. It's managed poorly. People don't understand what data management is. And, and it's just a nightmare to put together, you know, to think about, you know, where is my data? How do I get access to it? And, and part of that, it becomes an anti-pattern in the cloud because you think about data being owned by a service. Um, but then there's this thing that happened over the last couple of years called data lakes, where, you know, where companies were recognizing that it, it's actually not necessarily a bad thing to, you know, have data be widely available for analytical and reporting purposes without needing to do anything other than just, you know, point a cloud-based tool at it so you could process it. So the, the idea of everything needing to go through a services-based API, that, that gradually eroded and it's created a lot of opportunities. But if you just sort of take a step back and say, well, mm, how do I start? Where do I go from? Again, you know, the mainframe has some amazing built-in storage management services and archival and retrieval and, and managing, you know, retention to move to, le to, to less expensive forms of storage over time and until it's eventually just meet its, meets its retention limits and it's discarded. Um, Files are all, you know, esoteric file systems. You know, you you basically they don't exist anywhere else on any other platform. Uh, you know, DB2 is an, an ANSI compliant SQL relational database. Um, that's a little easier to move your data out of. But the the, the big thing you need to think about is your, your data is in a proprietary data architecture. Uh, you know, EBCDIC is the thing that jumps out at people. When when you look at that from a cloud perspective, you know, it, it, foremost in the cloud, you have no freaking idea where your data is beyond the zone. And and if you know what a zone is, it's essentially you know typically three data centers within close proximity with low latency networks and often storage is replicated across the zone. So that if a single, you know, a single facility goes down or even two goes down, the likelihood of data loss is extraordinarily low. Um, but you're, you, know, you go to the cloud and you've got this starting point and you say to yourself, do I really need to, to do a big data conversion to go there and, and step one? And the answer is, well, it depends, right? These are just different decisions you need to make and, and different products in the marketplace may provide you the ability to run with a, a mainframe data architecture and emulating mainframe file systems and, and other solutions, you know, including just a greenfield rewrite are going to require you to basically you know, change the code and change the data. And, and there's one thing that you can be certain of is the more change you introduce, particularly when you change data, the more risk that you're taking on in your, in your projects. Um, you know, other things to think about, when you move to the cloud, you have a wealth of, of different services and technologies, um, both open source and, and vendor provided that, you know, you, you can consume, you know, you're not locked into just a few options of how to, you know, store and access your data. And the other thing is that when, when data is at rest, often it's not just in these raw formats, like it used to be on the mainframe. We've adopted XML and, and JSON or comma separated, you know, value type files, just depending on what our intention is with that data. So the more semantics and enrichment that is implied to the data, you know, the higher quality that that data is for more uses and more integration points, particularly just, you know, cloud native services or potentially other SaaS services where you can quickly deliver business value by just pointing that service at your data. Um, but it's a journey to get there. And, and these are things that you need to think through. Software delivery, boy, oh boy, uh, this is something that it, it, if you've not lived in both worlds, if you've never sort of worked on a mainframe, you know, and then worked in a distributed environment cloud, uh, you, you just don't really have the perspective on this. So like, I just wanna reinforce a couple points. 
foremost, when you move from mainframe to the cloud, it is a much higher bar. It's like the difference between being in high school and, and being a professional athlete. And I don't mean to sound critical of, of mainframe teams. That's not the point. But you could read the bullets on this, on this slide. You know, the reality is that the mainframe, in as much as it's changed, it hasn't changed that much. You know, I, I had pivoted my career in 1988 because mainframe jobs paid better. I doubled my salary. So I did that. But all of the skills I learned in 1988 and all of the ways that I do software development and push things into production and, and the file systems I use, it hasn't changed in 34 years, right? So think about that. On the world of the cloud, DevOps is literally changing, like constantly. Tools are improving, new ideas, new things are being inventing, open source, you know, products are, are being matured, invented, retired. Cloud vendors are, are coming up with, with new ways to improve the way work gets done. And, and we've just learned so much from this agile DevOps revolution. Uh, you know, ec excellent book um, written by, by Dr. Nicole Forsgren. I think she's over at Microsoft now. Um, probably came out about four or five years ago. It was titled Accelerate. It was like the science of DevOps, really proving, uh, you know, empirically the business value, the commercial tangible value of improving software delivery performance. Now we live in a world where teams are expected to, to not just adopt these tools to benefit from them, but it actually delights them because it makes their job easier to have automated regression testing, to have automated metrics, to have faster feedback cycles, feedback about performance, feedback about feature adoption. It's, it's a whole new world. Integrations. Uh, the big ball of mud, I'm sure we've all seen diagrams like this before when people are, are trying to understand, say, the nightly batch cycle of five different systems. Or, you know, I have these 12 CICS regions that are all running, you know, very similar transactions and there's distributed processing involved. And we're just trying to understand all the different integrations and then which transactions go to which data sets and databases. And, and it becomes one of these things like you start looking at it and when you zoom out enough, you realize it is a big ball of mud. And the reason this happened is because, you know, in the mainframe environment, the, the best practices were around shared everything, shared infrastructure, uh, you know, you, you, you know, you might have APIs from one system or another, or you might just access the data directly. And, you know, you think about that, Today, you would never want one system directly accessing another systems directly, unless it were through, you know, uh, an, an established API, or it was potentially just data that it was pulling from a data lake or, or, or some other, you know, analytics system. Th that's generally considered a, a best practice in, in 12 factor apps or microservices. Um, and, and you think about how mainframe applications were integrated, a lot of the responsibility was pushed into middleware. And that's a theme you still see today with, with API gateways and, and different tools for, you know, connecting, you know, whether it's MQ-based applications, CICS-based applications, a lot of that responsibility is is put inside of a piece of middleware with some amount of configuration it's not the responsibility of the the mainframe application developer the the other thing to to really pay attention to a lot of mainframe applications were built at a time where they you you had you had data in IMS, which is a, a hierarchical database. You had data in VSAM, which is an indexed file system. You might have data in DB2. You might have data in DB2 in a different virtual machine or LPAR. And this idea of, of two-phase commit, XA compliant two-phase commit protocols took off in the 80s. 
and and it was really widely adopted uh, in in mainframe applications throughout the the the, the 90s from the, the best that i can recall there's no solution for that in the cloud and and while there might be some you know technologies from a few vendors what you're going to find is it's considered an anti pattern and the strategy around that again is pushing the responsibility into the application to manage eventual consistency. And you see this solved with a lot of use of, of queuing and, and reconciliation. Um, you start thinking about all of this, right? You're, you're moving from a low latency architecture and infrastructure to a higher latency and shared nothing. So a lot of things to think about. Um, operations. I think most mainframe people understand this. When things go bump in the night, usually there's a SWAT team that's handling it for you. Uh, that, that's been my experience for about the last you know, 30 years working with different teams. And, and these things, team to, they tend to be centralized, standardized, there's a lot of automation. And, and the reason that the mainframe teams were able to centralize this and had SWATs, that have SWAT teams handle it for the, the app teams, is because there were such rigorous standards, things that must be true before your application could reach production. And because there were not just standards, there were what were called playbooks or cookbooks, sort of run books, right? Like how to fix my application when it breaks. And just so many standards on how jobs would be designed so that they'd be easy to have a SWAT team intervene and, and recover and continue. When you go to the cloud, most companies don't have that type of, 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 a, of a centralized organization. And, and the reason is, is because this is a theme of Agile and DevOps is, 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 is over the last 20 years, this learning, this revelation about the way work gets done is just counterintuitive because it's always been optimized around decreasing change, managing resiliency, and, 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 and just trying to reduce change failure, and, and all in the name of, you know, the, the limitations of the machine, the compute. Well, we're not constrained by compute capacity. Machines and services are cheaper than people, and business wants to move faster. So this yin and yang relationship between autonomy and alignment has swung. The pendulum has greatly moved to autonomy. And what that means is the, the DevOps teams have a great deal of decision-making authority over how they're going to design their systems, over the programming languages they use, over how, the, how and when they're going to do deployments, how they manage operations, how they manage data, where companies companies tend to be standardized is around the software reliability engineering of making sure that you know things that things that drive the the the, the time to recovery and add risk to recovery are automated. And, and they try to standardize on metrics so that you can get this harmonized view of the health of your systems, even though they might all be getting managed differently and by different teams. So that's kind of cool. So when we talk about making the transition to cloud, I was, I was thinking about an old Seinfeld episode. I just burst out laughing. If, if I'm hoping there's some Seinfeld fans on the phone, but I remember this, this great episode where, you know, everything is, is, is going life going great in George Costanza's life because he sort of makes the decision. I'm going to do the opposite of everything that I would normally think to do. And it, 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 and it was just, it, it was a really funny episode, but, but it resonates because everything we just talked about with mainframe versus cloud, that's really what has happened in the last 30 years. If you look at the, if you go to 12factor.net, it's a website on, it's sort of like the de facto you know, manifesto on, on cloud native applications and, and, and around this 12 factor principles. And, and what you'll see is if you read that is everything that is true for a 12 factor app is largely false for a mainframe application. 
it's changed that much. So taking, you know, even with a tool like CloudFrame, you know, you don't want to take and just go from COBOL to Java and declare victory, right? That's a starting point. But where, you know, where we're going and how we're helping customers is, you know, there's things that come after that. And, and we're going to, we're going to get into that in a second. So it, I, I want to take two terms that, that I may have used. People who don't come from a mainframe world um, may not be familiar with these terms. Um, the terms are online and batch. And, and what's kind of funny about both of these is, so uh, online is, as you can see, it's just, it's, it's this concept or a construct that humans invented to describe when people are using, you know, applications on the mainframe. Because the mainframe, you know, like resources were scarce. Like what you could do with a system in the 70s, 80s, 90s is very different than what you could do today. But the way systems were historically designed on the mainframe is that a lot of the work that people did in online systems, the way that humans use the computer is essentially, you know, instructions or request transactions were created, but the actual changes didn't happen until the batch ran at night. So what would happen is, you know, you, you call up to say place an order at a catalog company that like you're going to laugh when I say these names like Sears or JC Penney's or Macy's. I don't even know if these stores exist today. And you might say, hey, I'd like to get a catalog and here's my address. So they'd capture that information, but the, the system that stores the customer information and, and adds a request to mail you this catalog, that doesn't get updated until two, three, four o'clock in the morning because there was no available compute resources to be able to do this during the day. And, and over time, this notion of real time, online real time, which is kind of an abomination of the term, but started to come out in the 90s, 2000s, when these mainframe systems were actually doing some of the work that used to be saved or batched up for processing when humans went to bed. So then when you look at, you know, what, what is batch? Well, Batches when we run all the computationally, computationally intense algorithms to process all the, the transaction, the data that was requested during, you know, during the daytime by, by users or just other, you know, other events, whether they're bank deposits or, or, or whatever. So when, when you think about moving to the cloud, what you have to think about as you evolve your applications and your architectures is this idea of batch and online doesn't need to exist anymore. Batch semantics, right, are, are certainly a way of processing data, but the idea of waiting until humans go to bed to continue processing is no longer required. So for example, you know, you think about like, well, what does good look like? Well, of, often companies will start with moving a mainframe system to the cloud and, and it's still it's still monolithic. With with tools like CloudFrame, with with tools like Microfocus COBOL, you know, we provide the ability, the backwards compatibility of mainframe file systems. And that means you, you're not required to convert your data over to Unicode ASCII. So that's a huge time to market accelerator and a huge way to de-risk. But so many times what I see people do is you have this single zone deployment and your data management is all oriented around a single zone. Well, what happens if that zone becomes unavailable? You've just left an environment with seven nines of availability and you've gone to an environment with considerably less. If that zone goes out because of the cloud provider's you know, mistake or your mistake, what's your backup plan, right? And this is where we, you know, I, I go to the, the next level, which is you know, and enter the cloud. And this is where you're looking at, at, at the reality of maybe running some of these applications in, you know, 
in a COBOL or Java or .NET language, some processes might run as fast or faster, even processing the same data volumes. But you have to remember the mainframe has had the luxury of working with a limited set of languages and the compilers, the operating system, and the hardware all comes from the same vendor. And as much as it's a monopoly, it's no more a closed ecosystem than what Apple's created. So everything they provide is highly optimized around their offerings. They have specialty hardware that just makes certain things run faster. Well, when you're running on general purpose compute in say a Linux, Unix, Windows environment, it's very possible that even though the code is performing as well as can be expected, it's just not going to be able to achieve the same throughput. And this is where you need to start taking advantage of things like partitioning or chunking of your data. And, and you also want to do things like think about multi-zone or even multi-region um, data management and, and data processing so that if you have an outage, by default, you have built in the ability to self-heal and recover and scale. And once you've done that, now you have built in the ability you know, to, to exceed mainframe availability and cycle times. You'll always have the limitation, right? Hypothetically, you know, what happens if the entire cloud platform goes down? Well, you can make the same argument. What happens if, you know, the mainframe goes down? Um, you know, there is just this sort of limitations of, of uh, at some point you're going to say three nines is enough, four nines is enough, five nines is enough, you know, or, you know, you want seven or 11. Now, what's the difference between that enter the cloud and in the cloud? When you are in the cloud, you know, this idea of, I no longer have this concept of, of batch, you know, like certainly online exists, there's, you know, systems that are integrating with APIs from, from your ecosystem partners uh, or, or, or people who are using web or mobile applications. Um, but this idea of, of waiting until people go to bed to, to process data no longer needs to exist. Um, you, you'll, you want to get your data into you know, the cloud native formats, which is foremost Unicode and very likely, but not necessarily ASCII, but, but very likely ASCII. And the reason you want to do that is because it, it unlocks the, the door to you know, being able to integrate with all the cloud native services. And you know, let's face it, um, you know, your Java developers, your .NET developers, lo looking at byte streams of data in emulated file systems and, and the data is in an EBCDIC collating sequence, it, it's just going to frustrate them. It's going to cause them to make mistakes. It's going to slow them down. It's going to complicate your test data management. It's going to complicate building test cases. So, you know, it's definitely a cool strategy as step one to save a ton of money and get off the mainframe using that emulation. But where you really want to, you know, get to is you want to quickly think about, you know, what is my microservices strategy and which microservices are really the masters of which data. And, and as you draw the sort of boxes around your old legacy, you know, programs and, and reimagine those as services and, and allocate responsibility for data management and ownership for certain data sets. Now, you know, what you have is the opportunity to put APIs, newer APIs between your services. You have the opportunity and the responsibility to put API lifecycle management in place. With that, you now have the luxury to start introducing new APIs based on Unicode and ASCII. You now have shrunk the blast radius of change to a single microservice, a single data entity or, or several data sets where teams can now begin this migration. And you can gradually strangle out those legacy EBCDIC based interfaces. And, and what's really neat is, you know, we helped a customer 
take you know a very large batch system and convert it over to a an event based you know as a service um, deployment. And, and it was as simple as just, you know, configuring or, or calibrating our code generator to replace, you know, flat file processing, which was the nature of, of their batch systems to use Kafka topics. So it's, it's really cool when you think about the art of the possible and, and what automation can provide. And, you know, I'm, I'm saying that and, 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 you know, that we're doing it. I'm sure there's other companies doing it too. And, and I'm sure, you know, people could figure out how to do this on themselves. Uh, you think about um, cloud, cloud native and, 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 and this is where the, this idea of, um, oh, there's a typo on my slide it just mentally cross out where it says semantics delay. You think about where you're processing the data and, and how to process it where it best serves the customer. And, and you think back to some of these legacy systems and you know, depending on the decade they were written, you know, are your online systems doing that sort of online real-time updates? Were they just sort of generating transactions to be, you know, sort of processed later? Is that still the right sort of architecture? Because now it becomes much easier to change in this very fluid environment with modern technologies, you know, in, you know, with, with, with teams that are moving at the speed of DevOps with, with Java or .NET languages. And it, it, so, so it, it's something to think about, right? And, and being able to, to integrate with native services for, for, for analytics opportunities and, and machine learning opportunities. These are things that have just never been done with data that's been sitting on the mainframe or it's been very compartmentalized. You, you, you talk to people who come from a data science background and inevitably you're gonna meet somebody who, who, who asks you, you know, are you listening to your data? What is your data telling you? And, and the question they're asking you is, you know, what type of analytics, what type of machine learning algorithms, what are you doing to derive insights from your data? Um, and then, you know, I, I couldn't think of a cool way to fit cloud into continuous improvement, but there, there's, there is just this expectation when you move to, you know, a cloud DevOps operating model and, and deployment strategy that you're never done. You're never done with that system because the platform you've deployed it on is constantly changing. There's new innovations coming every day. There is this notion of FinOps, financial operations, of, of always looking at how can I take advantage of the cool things that are happening in the world of technology or on the cloud platform I'm on? Because say a new release of a virtual machine is available and the cost performance of that is less expensive than the one I'm on, right? Uh, there's, a different way that I, there's a different way that I could process my data if I move it out of, you know, my now Java application, and I just do a lot of what is nothing more than ETL work, which is a lot of what happens in, in mainframe systems. A lot of it really is nothing more than ETL. Are there some pieces of, of, you know, of these programs that just make sense to move into a cloud service? Because one, it's a hell of a lot easier to maintain configuration, and two, it's less expensive. Um, so the, those are the exciting things that I think about. And, you know, for me, when I, I think about my role with, with CloudFrame and, and, and steering our, our product roadmap, I get real excited about taking companies, taking applications through these phases. You know, I want to allow customers to do this as quickly as possible, but on their terms and timelines. So we want to give, you know, we want to, to, to create solutions to make it easy to chunk data. We want to create solutions and provide ways to, to do the data conversions where it makes sense and, and to take data and to put it into markups like JSON and XML, you know, where it makes sense. And we want to build classifiers into our tools so we can recommend and even, you know, give you a way to, to, to say, hey, here's 
here's parts of a program or an entire program that we think could be replaced by this Azure service, this AWS or GCP service, and you could retire these thousands of lines of Java code. So it, it just makes the overall cost of maintaining that system, changing the system and the bill you get from your cloud provider much lower. Um, case studies, you know, we, um, we, we have quite a few case studies. I, I won't go through this in, in exhausting detail. Um, you can definitely just pull this down from, um, you know, from our, our website. And, and I'm squinting to, 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 just, to just read this. Um, so this was a, this is a really interesting application. We, 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 have, a, we have a customer that, that runs a, a, large, a large payments network and they are proactively responding to data sovereignty laws. And, and what they're doing is they're, they're decentralizing the processing of that data and you know the storage processing transmitting of that data to you know the the different regions or countries knowing that regulations are changing and and in some countries like india you know there's a deadline it's already happened and so what they're able to do is they're they're using our tool the the, the system of record is very much a mainframe system maintained in cobol but they'll, they'll take that system, run it, that COBOL system, run it through our renovate tool, generate a Java-based deployment. And, and they can do that so darn quickly that they can actually just deploy a Java stack of that mainframe system and now start running operations in you know, the cloud platform of their choice in the region of the world where they need to to comply with you know the regulations for processing that data um, what's really neat about it is is this project ran about 75 percent faster in in terms of overall you know uh weeks and months to deliver and resources needed to to develop it uh, it was an exciting journey because you know we got to 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 discover a lot of a lot of you know, problems that we could help our customer solve. So it was a great sort of customer driven innovation for us. So, you know, we did things like, you know, say, hey, uh, we could take that JCL and convert it to spring batch. We can give you DF sort support off the mainframe. And, you know, and this was the system that we, you know, would eventually support their, their sort of question of, you know, how do we turn this into a, an event driven as a service type of system, because we don't really want to just do, you know, file based batch processing anymore. And, you know, it was probably a couple of days of, of one of our engineers just sort of thinking about how to solve it. And this is what's really cool about our tool is, is that we have the ability to quickly calibrate how the code generator works without changing the line of, of Java code. It's all external configuration. Um, so we just changed the way that we would generate code for file processing to be based on Kafka. And, and they were able to, to take containerize that and, and, and deploy it around their, their pivotal Cloud Foundry strategy. So they're they're using our tool to generate you know what they consider to be um, cloud neutral cloud native you know application deployments of a legacy mainframe system. So if we don't have any questions, then we'll adjourn for the day. I want to thank you again and uh, wish you a great afternoon. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate your uh, your delivery of the of the information.